slide, a, let's say, a curling rock across ice or anything really across ice um, such that friction is really, really low, call it zero, what forces act, what other forces act on the object that's moving horizontally? In the absence of friction, friction is so low that it doesn't matter, what other force or forces act on this object as it slides across the ice? Gravity does. Yep. Gravity acts down. Yep. Like an air resistance? Okay. Yeah, air resistance possibly. Um, we're going to say that in this situation uh, that air resistance is not going to act. We're going to make it an idealized situation so there is no air resistance. Realistically, there is. There always is, unless you're in a vacuum or out in space. There is air resistance. But we're going to say that there is no air resistance. Okay. So, so far all we've got here with our idealized situation is gravity acting down. That's a vertical force acting down, right? Any other horizontal forces acting? There's no friction, there's no air resistance, there's nothing like that. Yep. Mass. Mass isn't a force. Mass is inertia and it's a tendency to keep an object doing what it's doing. But it's not a force that's going to cause it to speed up or slow down. In fact, it's, it's essentially the opposite of that. Inertia is, or mass, which is inertia, is uh, the tendency to not change motion, to not speed up or slow down. Listen, the point I'm going to try to get across here is that when something's moving horizontally, uh, in the absence of air resistance or friction, there are no horizontal forces acting. Okay? It's moving at a constant velocity. In other words, we could describe the motion we could describe the motion of this curling rock or whatever it is that's moving horizontally by V is equal to delta D over delta T. Does that make sense? Be a group A problem. If there's no forces acting, there's no reason it's going to speed up or slow down, so it's going to be described by V is equal to delta D over delta T. Now, horizontally, right? Now, what if I take a, a ball and I throw that ball up into the air? Or I drop a ball, it doesn't really matter. What forces act on it this time? Sorry? Gravity, just like acted on the curling rock, but we were only looking at the horizontal part of that curling rock. Gravity acts, right? Any other forces? It doesn't matter if it's going up or going down. Gravity is going to act on this, right? It's going to accelerate. That would be a group B problem. And in most cases, I would actually describe the motion of this, or at least a lot of cases, I would describe the motion of this ball by using D is equal to VIT plus 1 half AT squared. Remember, all of those acceleration equations are valid. All five of them are valid. This is the one that, or this is one of the ones that I could use, the one that I'm writing down, because it's going to be the one that makes the point that I want to make. So this curling rock, this, this ball, whatever, going horizontally, in the absence of friction or air resistance, constant velocity V is equal to delta D over delta T. This rock or ball that I'm throwing up into the air or dropping from a certain height is influenced by gravity only, and we could describe it by using a group B equation, uh, d is equal to vit plus 1 half at squared. Good? Nothing new here, right? Like, we've done this, like, this was day two of physics 20, and then we spent quite a few days looking at those group B equations. So nothing new here, yet. Have a look at this, though. This time, we're not sliding the ball across the ice with no horizontal forces. This time we're not throwing the ball straight up into the air with just gravity. This time we're throwing the ball up into the air at an angle. So in other words, it's got like a horizontal component of its initial velocity, right? And it's got a vertical component of that velocity. Does that make sense? How do you think we describe the horizontal component of that velocity? In the absence of friction or air resistance, what do you think happens to the horizontal component? No different than the curling rock. Horizontally, this ball that I'm throwing up at an angle is moving at a constant velocity. Does that make sense? If I slide something horizontally, there's no horizontal forces, it goes at a constant velocity, then why, when I throw something at an angle, would the horizontal component not be constant velocity? in the absence of friction or air resistance. It is. So we're going to describe the x component by using the equation v is equal to delta d over delta t. But what about the vertical component? Vertically, this ball, as it goes up into the air, and then it's going to come back down, right, is going to experience gravity. 
How do we describe a problem that involves gravity? Well, one of our group B equations. Which one do we want to use? Well, I'm telling you that they all apply, but this is the one that I'm going to use because this is the one that works the most often. D is equal to VIT plus 1 half AT squared. If this object goes at a constant velocity horizontally the whole time, then it's going to end up horizontally. Its motion is going to look like this. Right? The velocity isn't changing. But vertically, as it goes up, it slows down. And then it speeds up as it comes back down. That make sense? So horizontally, constant velocity, the vector length stays the same. Vertically, the vector length changes because of acceleration. What's the path of this end up looking like? It ends up looking like this. Does anybody know what the shape of that path is called? You're doing this right now. If you're taking Math 20, you're doing this right now in Math 20. Like literally right now in Math 20. What's it called? It's a parabola. Yeah, it's a parabola. Do you guys remember the general equation for a parabola in math class? Forget about physics for a second. The general equation for a parabola. General equation for a straight line, we talked about this, right, is y is equal to mx plus b. Right? The general equation for a parabola, Jacob, is? Right, y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus C. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time tying together the mathematics of this with the physics of this, but I will just for a second here, okay? Let's, for just a second, kind of off to the side, look at this green equation here. D is equal to VIT plus 1 half AT squared. Delta D is, stands for what? Delta D stands for what? Displacement, right? And displacement is change in position, right? So delta D, you don't have to write this down if you don't want to, okay? That's, you're not going to be tested on the math class part of this. I just want to tie it together since this is what you're doing in math class right now. Delta D is, is displacement, which is change in position, which is DF minus DI. Agree? Yes? We don't usually write it like that, but we could write it like that if we wanted to, right? Now let's take the DI over to the other side by adding. So we'd end up getting DF is equal to VIT plus one half at squared plus di, right? If we change the order of this a little bit, look at what we'd end up with. df is equal to uh, one half at squared plus vit plus di. Does that look a little bit familiar to you? Maybe not. Maybe not. But if we're plotting a graph of vertical position, and that's where we are here, right? This is the y component. Vertical position versus time. Vertical position versus time. Then this would be our y-axis, right? And time would be our x-axis. In other words, it would look like this. y is equal to something times t squared or x squared plus something times x plus something. What's the what's the, the coefficient that goes in front of the x squared? Well, we call it a in the general equation. It would be one half of the acceleration. Vi would be uh, b, and delta or sorry, and di would be c. So that is the equation, right? Y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c is df is equal to 1 half at squared plus, um, plus vit plus di. Does that make sense? Now, if you remember from math class, parabolas we usually see looking like this, right? How do you describe that parabola? It's just an upside down parabola, right? But how do you describe that upside down parabola? What's the difference in the equation between this parabola and this parabola? Pardon? Yeah, it's been reflected across the x-axis, yeah, which means that on the equation, the coefficient is negative, right? This coefficient right here is negative when it's upside down like this, right? What's one half of A, one half of the acceleration? What's the acceleration? Yeah, which is? No, negative 
9.81. Why is this an upside down parabola? Well, physically it has to be, right? Because that's the way the world works. It just follows a parabola. But mathematically, it, it follows beautifully, right? The coefficient here is negative 4.905. This value of A is negative 4.905. That make sense? Maybe you go back to math class now and, and it makes a tiny bit more sense. I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, but in the end, in the end, it's nice that you're doing that right now because um, it does justify at least for us why we're using this equation, right? Why are we using this equation to describe it? Well, because it's a parabola. And why wouldn't you use the equation for a parabola to describe a parabola? Okay, we call this a projectile. This is the topic that we're doing today and tomorrow is called projectile motion. A projectile is an object that moves through the air in the absence of any force other than gravity. So this ball, I'm throwing through the air at an angle, don't know what the angle is, whatever. It's moving under the influence of just gravity. Because it's just gravity, there's no horizontal forces, it, the, the horizontal component of this motion can be described by V is equal to delta D over delta T. The vertical component can be described by one of the acceleration equations. Probably we're going to use this one because this one is the equation for a parabola. Make sense? Now, when you're actually solving this problem, whatever it is that you're looking for, and it can vary depending upon the question, the strategy is actually quite simple. What I want you to do when you see one of these projectile motion questions is always start this way. Write down the two equations under x and y. Start that way, always, every single time. Question number one on your final exam, I'm telling you right now, question number one on your final exam is a projectile motion question. Everybody, uh, you might make a mistake on it. It happens, right? It's, it's okay to make a mistake. But everybody should start off by writing down those two equations. Everybody should get at least one point out of 83 on your final exam because all you got to do to get one point out of 83 is write down those two equations in question number one. I'm telling you, that's what you're going to do first if you want your first point out of 83. Got it? Then just sub in numbers. Whatever numbers you have given to you in the question, set them in and solve for something. It sounds odd for me to say this, but you're not actually going to consciously try to solve for anything in particular. You're just going to sub the numbers and whatever, whatever you get out of it, you get out of it. Like whatever happens, happens. You're going to be able to solve for something. If it's what you're looking for, great. If it's not what you're looking for, oh well, you got something else that you didn't have before. That's going to help you get what you're actually looking for. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a, almost a, a brute force just go at it without really necessarily knowing exactly what you're doing. Right? Conceptually, we know what we're doing, but in terms of subbing our numbers in, it's just like sub them in and get what you get. And then figure it out later. Okay? Let's take a look at an example and see if we can kind of apply that. A little bit more here. Uh, this is example number 20. I think it's the second to last one in your unit. Ball rolling at 10 meters per second on a flat roof, 15 meters above the ground, rolls off the edge. Let's draw this out here. Okay, there's this roof that's 15 meters above the, uh, above the ground. Here's this ball that's rolling at 10 meters per second. Well, that isn't going to go like this, is it? No, it isn't. That's just going to go like... this. Is that still a parabola? Yeah, it's just a half a parabola, right? We describe a half a parabola mathematically the same way as we describe a full parabola, right? It's just a portion of it, that's all. So what do we do? Well, just like question number one on your final exam. You write down x's and y's. And you write down the two equations that describe this. The first equation for x is, you guys remember this? Which, is, which one is it, Jack? V is equal to delta D over delta T. Now, like realistically, you're probably going to just memorize that. But I also want you to know why. Why is it V is equal to delta D over delta T? Like come final exam time, you got so much stuff to remember at that point. We want to know why. Because sometimes we forget things. If we know why, we're less likely to forget things. Why is it V equals D over T? Well, there are no forces acting. 
horizontally, there's nothing to speed it up or slow it down. So in the absence of something to speed it up or slow it down, it moves at a constant velocity. And any time moves at a const anything that moves at a constant velocity is described by group A, which is V equals delta D over delta T. Now vertically, why? Well, that's any of the group B equations, right? Because now we got gravity. But the one that I'm going to use is this one. And why am I using this one? Well, because if we change the order of that and it's a parabola, right? That is the parabola equation. You guys have a little bit of an advantage over semester one, because in semester two, all of you have either taken math 20 or are taking math 20. It's not a huge deal for most things. It really isn't. Okay, most times, if you're strong in math 10, physics 20 is doable. Okay, but knowing that this is a parabola shape, it might remind us that this is the equation that we use to describe the y component. If you don't know what a parabola is, you're just going to have to remember that, right? If you know what a parabola is, it might just kind of flow naturally for you. OK, what do we say is next? Kind of brute force, right? Sub in what you got. What is this 10 meters per second? That's a, that's a velocity, right? What velocity is it? Is it this velocity, x component, or is, this, is it this velocity, vi, for the y component? Which one is it? Jacob? vi for the y component? Nope. It's not both. It's the x component, right? It's the x component. Look, this ball is moving on a flat roof horizontally at 10 meters per second. The horizontal velocity is 10 meters per second. So let's sub that in here. Do we know how far it moves horizontally? Like displacement, this is like this distance right here. Do we know that number? No, that's what we're looking for, right? Do we know how much time it's in the air for? Nope. Oh, well. Well, that wasn't very helpful then, was it? I subbed in 10. It didn't really help me, but whatever. Remember what I said? It's brute force, right? Just get what, you, get what you can get. Don't worry about it. If something doesn't work out for you, something else will work out for you. Uh, OK, let's, let's take a look at the y component here then, all right? Delta D for the y component. Do we know what that is? This is over the entire trip. Do we know what this is, Marshall? Yes, good. Negative 15. Why is it negative, Marshall? Yes. It's negative 15. Um, negative because it's falling and 15 because, well, it ends up 15 meters below where it started, right? Does that make sense? What would VI be for the Y component? How fast is this ball moving initially when it's released? Now, I'm not talking about like a second and a half after it's released. That's going to be different, right? Horizontally, we call it V because it's not changing. It's 10 the whole time, horizontally. Vertically, we call it VI because, well, it starts at a certain velocity vertically, but then it changes because of gravity. Zero. zero. Yeah, zero. Look, it's launched horizontally. So VI would be zero for the Y component. I was going to cross that whole term off. Now, if we launched it at an angle like this, right, like we did back here, the I wouldn't be zero, would it? But then, if we had this, we'd have a funny angle. And if we had a funny angle, what would we do? Well, we don't like funny angles, right? So we take it off to the side, we break it up into x components and y components, and we sub the x in right here, and we sub the y in right here. We'll do an example tomorrow like that. Don't panic about that right now. Does it make sense why it's zero? It's launched horizontally. It's not going to be zero for long. But it's zero initially when it's launched. A is, what's A? Yeah, neg 9.81 times t squared. Uh, so this is neg 15 is equal to negative 4.905, a half 9.81. Usually we rearrange after, before we sub our numbers in, but in these questions, I tend to do it after. Um, I got to get rid of the 4.905. How do I do that? Divide it, yeah. So it's going to be negative 15 divided by negative 4.905. Uh, negative 15 divided by negative 4.905 gives me a value of 3.0581. Uh, 
Now, what's t going to be? Square root of that. Square root of that, right? So let's square root that answer, 1.7487. How come I wrote down like four decimal places there? Why did I not round it to like 1.7 meters per, or, or sorry, seconds, sir? Why did I not round that, Jack? It is more exact, and, and I want to be more exact until until I get to a final answer, right? Good. Be as exact as you can until the final answer, right? Um, now what? What are you going to do now? This is what I want to find, isn't it? How far it moves horizontally, how far from the edge of the building that it lands. Yeah? Plug the time in here. Right? Plug the time in here. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I used 10 for velocity here, 0 for velocity here. So it's not the same velocity. If I, can, if I can't use the same velocity from x to y, why are you telling me I can use the same time? for x to y. Marcello? Because time is a scalar. Velocity is a vector, so x and y are different, right? Displacement is a vector, x and y are different. But time is a scalar, x and y are... There is no x and y as far as time is conserved. conserved. So let's sub that in. Let's say 10 is equal to delta d over 1.7487. And how am I going to take that up by, to find delta d? The 1.74 goes to the other side by multiplying. So it becomes 17 meters. How far from the base of the building is this ball going to land? 17 meters from the base of the building. Let's have a look for homework at worksheet number 9, questions 1. Not 1 to 3, but just 1 and 3. Sorry? Yeah. Nothing wrong with two, but it's just a tiny bit different, and I don't want to focus here just on one and three right now. All right, one and three for homework. You got, uh, what, about nine minutes to work on in class, so maybe even finish it before you leave today.